Welcome to worship at First Baptist Church today. We're so glad that you have joined us. We are aware that you may not be watching this via live stream, but watching a recording of this service. Uh, we've been having trouble for the last couple of weeks with our internet service provider. We are aware of the problems and we're trying to get them to fix it diligently, working behind the scenes to get them to give us the broadband uh, that we need. So we are aware and hope to have this remedied by next week. But anyway, we gather ourselves for worship this morning, and I ask you to join me in prayer. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. God, we gather ourselves from many different places into this sacred moment aware that wherever and however we find ourselves, you are there. Today we hear once again the story of Moses and the burning bush and remember your abiding promise through the ages, I will be with you. So open our hearts to all the ways you are speaking to us today in hymn and song, prayer and proclamation and all the ways your spirit is moving among us for your glory and for our good and for the sake of your world. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. scripture lesson comes from the Psalms, Psalm 105. 
Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he has uttered, O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. This is the word of the Lord. Our second scripture lesson is from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come. I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus, you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever seen a need and wanted to help, but you weren't sure what you could do or if you could help? I love the story of Hannah Taylor, who when she was five years old, saw a man eating out of a garbage can on a cold winter day. This made her very sad, and she began to think about ways that she could help. By the time she was eight, she had started the Ladybug Foundation. She chose to call it the Ladybug Foundation 
because first of all, ladybugs bring good luck. And she figured that we would need good luck helping those who are homeless. And homeless people often need good luck in their lives. And also, she was just a kid who wanted to go out, who wanted to catch frogs, and she loved bugs. And so her favorite bug was the ladybug. Since the very beginning, the Ladybug Foundation's core value, core message, and core goal has never changed. And the idea is to share the love that you have and care about each other always. It's about giving from your heart and connecting as many hearts as possible. Then there is the story of Chloe, who decided to give back by sewing face masks, like this one, during COVID-19, nine-year-old Chloe is doing her part to support her community in central Indiana by sewing face coverings to reduce the spread of the coronavirus. She's donating them to a local health clinic and to elderly individuals who live in her neighborhood. Sometimes we see a need and we want to help, but it can be a little scary and we may not know what to do or think that we can really do anything. That reminds me of the story of Moses and the burning bush from Exodus chapter 3. God appeared to Moses at the burning bush and told him that he had heard the cry of the people of Israel in Egypt, that he had seen their oppression. He told Moses, I will send you to Pharaoh to let my people go. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Moses knew that there was a need, but he was scared and he didn't think he could do what God was asking him to do. But God said to him, I will be with you. And Moses went and God was with him every step of the way and the rest is history. So if you see a need and you want to help out, Remember God's words to Moses, I will be with you. Follow your heart and know that God will be with you. Even if you might think to yourself, hey, I'm just a kid, what can I do? You can do a lot. And remember that God will be with you always. Amen.
Would you join me as we go to God in prayer? Loving God, listening God. In this time of prayer, our hearts are conflicted. As we pause drawing nearer to you, we recognize that we hardly do this enough. On this 13th Sunday after Pentecost, we know that tongues of fire continue to burn all around us. And yet, we've brushed past them, we've avoided them, and we've pressed on without taking the time to look for you in the midst of confusion. When another brother's life has been taken by police brutality, we've tried to explain it away. When another disastrous hurricane has destroyed life and property, we failed to acknowledge how our own exploitive behaviors contribute to these catastrophic weather events. God, we have brooded and critiqued the way things are rather than looking to you for the way things ought to be. So let us pause now and follow Moses' example. Let us pause and pay close attention, not only with our eyes, but with our feet that we might truly feel your presence. O oh Lord, may we receive sight where our vision has been too short and too shallow. Plant our feet that we may truly experience the uneven landscape around us. Fix our eyes on the ways of Christ and our feet the light of your word. When we feel discouraged, Lord, may we look to you and your strength, seeking your face always, remembering the wonders you have done, remembering your promise to journey with us. And when we do not know what to pray, let us pray as Christ continues teaching us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, the times, they are a-changing. It was 1964, 56 years ago, when the sounds of the harmonica, guitar, and a distinct tone and voice accompany for the first time that single verse refrain, the times they are a changing. Bob Dylan, songwriter, musician, poet, 2016 Nobel Prize recipient, wrote those words for a time when demonstrations, marches, and civil unrest in cities and towns were on the rise in this country. Two years ago, in 2018, which was nearly 55 years after those words were first penned and sung by Dylan, that song was included in the student-led March for Our Lives on the National Mall. This march occurred in the aftermath of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School shooting in Florida. Lynn Neary, an NPR story reported on this event, which included this Dylan song. 
She shared that one of the choir members, Theron Fowler, was amazed that one song could be so powerful. Theron said this, that the anthem, it brought us together for something bigger than ourselves. No matter what race, what culture, background, religious whatever, it brought everyone together. A song written to apply to a context in the early 1960s had present meaning and power some 50 years later. March 2020 has become a bit of a reference point for pre and post COVID world. Since then, not only due to the impact of change on our daily living, but also with the protest turmoil and increased spotlight on deep-seated injustice. We can all sing those words with Dylan. At times, they are a changing. Let me share one verse of this song with you. And I want you to remember that these were written 56 years ago, not last week. Come, senators, congressmen, please heed the call. Don't stand in the doorway, don't block up the hall. For he that gets hurt will be he who has stalled. The battle outside is raging. Will soon shake your windows and rattle your walls for the times they are a-changing. What makes something timeless? What gives it lasting power? What are the qualities of a message or a song or a poem that enable it to become a message that applies to time and context decades, even centuries later. Well, I think certainly it has to carry meaning and it has to be authentic to the very present moment in which it is directed. It's got to be true for that specific time. Lynn Neary also said this, reporting on the use of the song in 2018, she claimed it had a new meaning half a century later, saying, because the song itself doesn't look to the past, rather it's an anthem of hope for a future where change is always possible. I think that describes another quality of a message for all time, a message that looks forward, not backward. It holds a message of hope for a future where new life, productive life, improved living is possible. When your life turns sideways and skids out of control, what guides you? When all the normalcy in our life is disrupted, what grounds us? When the outlook ahead is confusing, if not conflicting, what message do you long to hear? Well, as people of faith, we turn to God and to the witness of God in Scripture for grounding and guidance. A message for our current time, indeed, I think a message for all the times in our lives that challenge us and shock us, that rattle us and confound us. A message for all of time, past, present, and what is still yet to come is the message which God gives to Moses at that critical moment of conflict and call, the message from God, I will be with you. The cries of the people are under, who are under heavy oppression have captured the attention of God. Hearing them, God remembers his covenant with them and now God captures the attention of Moses in the burning bush. If you remember, Moses has fled Egypt. He ran away from murder that he has committed. He resides now as a shepherd with his father-in-law in the land of Midian. And there at the bush, Moses hears God say, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I've come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Thank goodness 
God is on his way. But then comes the attention getter. As if the burning bush was not already enough to capture Moses' attention, God says, So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Moses is to be more than just a messenger of God. He is being called what Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann describes as the executive agent. God is the active agent in the process, but Moses, as the executive agent, he is to be the instrument to bring this message into reality, to make it happen. No wonder Moses responds with the question, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Moses doubts his ability to carry out this task. He offers a variety of excuses. Moses is looking for some kind of certainty, too. He wants a guarantee. But with each excuse and hesitation, God refutes it. The sign that God gives is that when Moses brings the people out from Egypt, they will return to this very mountain where, they will, where Moses is now, and they will worship God. That's his guarantee. It comes at the end of his journey. But that is not all that God says. It's the other five words of promise and hope which God gives to Moses that becomes the message for this time and for all times to come. I will be with you. It's not the first time, and nor is it the only time that this message comes from God. Earlier in Genesis, the 26th chapter, God sends Isaac to Gerar because there was a famine in the land where they were living and he was directed to go not to Egypt. He was instructed instead to settle in the land that God will show him and to live there as an alien. And God says to him, I will be with you. It's a word of promise that we can hear when we're called to move forward to an unfamiliar place or experience. Maybe like an experience of going to college for the first time where all things are new. Maybe it's like having to teach or to perform one's job in a way that is completely like anything you've ever done before or were even prepared to do. So in those times like that and others, hear the promise of God. I will be with you. In Deuteronomy, in the 31st chapter, decades after the deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt, the time of Moses' passing is drawing near. The change in leadership is on the horizon. And Joshua hears this from the Lord God. Be strong and bold, for you shall bring the Israelites into the land that I promised them. I will be with you. The mantle of leadership is changing. God's promise to Moses and the Hebrew people is about to reach completion with Moses and now Joshua is about to step up into a new role. Have you had to face a new role in your life this year? When a spouse dies, we may be forced to learn new roles of decision making and responsibility. When someone leaves a work team, roles change and responsibilities shift. Role changes can be unsettling. The message that came to Joshua is the message from God that you need to hear and remember. Be strong and bold. I will be with you. In the book of Joshua, we read that the time has come to cross the Jordan into the land that has been promised for generations. The Lord God speaks to Joshua, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. And God continues by saying this, I hereby command you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Again, as the people are preparing to go a way that they have never gone before, the 
Lord God shares with Joshua, that he's going to lift him up so that the people will know that God will be with Joshua. This means also that God will be with the whole people as they cross into this new land and new culture and new way of life. Here we are, facing a new horizon in what it means to be church and how to be church as we make a transition into a post-COVID-19 world at some point. We have questions that run simultaneously. When will this end? Will this change the way that we do things forever? What happens if it takes longer than we anticipate? It's very important we remember these words of God. I will be with you. In Judges, we find this phrase. The book contains that recurring saga of how the people of God flow back and forth in and out of faithfulness with God. Various leaders are called out and rise up to give aid in restoring the people. One of the judges that's featured is Gideon. Because once again, the people have lapsed in their faithfulness. And this time, it's the Midianites were the ones who had stepped in as the oppressors. And once again, the people cry out to God from hell. The angel of the Lord comes to Gideon and says this, The Lord is with you, you mighty warrior. Gideon is told that he is to go in this great might of his, and he is to deliver Israel. God says to him, I have commissioned you. And what is Gideon's reply? He says, how can I do such a thing? For my clan is the weakest of all the clans, and besides that, I am the least in all my family. Gideon claims to be the least among the least. And God's reply is, I will be with you. You ever have those times when you feel small and insignificant? When you feel defeated and forgotten? Do you have times when you feel inferior to all those around you and not qualified to step in and make a contribution? I think that's one reason why I am attracted to Gideon and this feeling that he has. Because for so many years, through all of my school and even into my early career, I always felt like that I really wasn't that smart and that everyone else around me was so much smarter. What did I have to contribute and offer? It's in those very times that we need to hear what Gideon heard. Feeling that he was small and insignificant and least among the least, he heard the words of God, I will be with you. In Isaiah, in the 43rd chapter, Prior to the people's return from exile, they received the prophecy of assurances that God has called them, redeemed them, and will be present with them as they make the transition through the challenging passage that is ahead of them. In verse 2, we read these words. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. When the path in life that you are on is difficult, God says to you, I will be with you. When the transition ahead is uncertain and challenging, God says, I will be with you. When we are looking for and hoping for a new normal, remember that through the transition from here to there, God says, I will be with you. And when your world has turned upside down and sideways, placing you in a situation that you have no reference point for how to cope or proceed, then hear the words that the Virgin Mary heard when Gabriel came bringing her the news of an unexpected pregnancy. The Lord is with you. I'm reminded of my experience at Passport Kids Camp four years ago. 
It's still a very vivid picture. On the first day of camp, I stepped out of my room onto the hallway on that very first night, and at the same time, a child in the room next door stepped out of his room. We turned and looked at one another, and as we did, he said to me, we're neighbors. The next night, we met up in the hallway once again. This time, his church leader, Kent, was with him. Charlie said, we're not neighbors anymore. Well, his leader was a bit shocked and about to correct Charlie, but I wasn't offended. I knew exactly what he meant. You see, on the second day, after that first night, in the room that we were in, in the dorm we were in, we had to all pack up and move our things to another room on the other side of campus. See, the problem was in the dorm we were staying, we had no cold water. No, I didn't misspeak. We had plenty of hot water. We had no cold water. The only thing we had was hot water. In every faucet, in everything that held water, in the showers and all, scalding water was coming out. So we had to move. So in our new location, Charlie and I were no longer side by side on the hallway. We weren't next door neighbors. So to Charlie, we weren't neighbors anymore but we remained very neighborly because we kept running into each other and talking with one another. You know, some children at camp are just like that. They come up and start talking to strangers and every time you see them, they'll come over and start talking with you about all kinds of things. The really odd thing was is that I came to learn later from Charlie's leaders that Charlie was not that kind of kid. It was not his usual practice to just strike up conversations with people like that. But I also learned that he was experiencing a really tough time in his life at the present. His parents were separating and it was very, very difficult for them. Kent, the male leader, revealed a story to me that I really want to share. Kent had been helping Charlie's father by staying with Charlie one day while the father was taking care of various things. The fridge that was in their house was old and had some rust and paint deterioration on the side. Because of all the things going on and he being the youngest, Charlie, because he had two older sisters, he really wanted to help out. So he decided he wanted to paint the fridge and he took it upon himself to do so. You can imagine what happened. Kent had happened to overhear Charlie's father say to him before he left not to get into the paint. Kent realized that Charlie had managed to not only get into the paint, but to make a bit of a mess in his attempt to help out. So he had a talk with Charlie. And he told Charlie that he should consider telling his dad about this before his dad found out. He said that it would be hard, but that it would be worse if he didn't own up to it and tell him. And then Kent offered this to Charlie. If you want, I will be with you when you tell it. And so he did. Charlie couldn't see past the dreaded experience of his dad finding out what happened. He couldn't envision surviving past that kind of confrontation. Kent was being like God for Charlie. This man was making real for this young child the message that God gives to each one of us, I will be with you. Charlie still had to face the difficult task of telling his father what he had done. He did not escape having to admit doing wrong and face the consequences, but he was able to do that knowing that he was not alone. There was someone standing with him who loved him and would continue to love him in and through all the circumstances that he faced. Kent gave Charlie hope, hope to go forward. If you're ever wondering what to say to someone in the face of tragedy or when the diagnosis returns with a bad report, if you're ever wondering what to say to someone who has experienced the loss of job or a death in their family. 
These five words will support them and will not offend them. I will be with you. With these words, you give presence, you give hope, and you give love. In these times of physical distancing, injustices of all kinds, and lingering uncertainty, people need to experience that there is a God of love, empowerment, and hope. We all hunger to see Christians who care and offer love as God cares and loves. So in these times that are a-changing, we are looking for hope. The hope to move forward into a future toward new life and new ways of living. Hope to live in a time that moves toward justice and reconciliation, toward kindness and respect. It may well be that the hope we are looking for will become real as we choose to embrace this message, as we choose to trust it and put it into practice. And we can shine light on this hope by being as God was to Moses for others, to be a Kent to a Charlie. This is a message for our time of uncertainty. This is a message calling us forward into a future with hope and promise. This is a message by which we can live all our days in all times and for all time. I will be with you.
true today as it is each Sunday. It is so good to share in worship with you, and we are very thankful for your presence and your continued love and prayers as we continue on as First Baptist Church in this community and to one another. And now receive this benediction. With the love of God, the Creator is your foundation. With the mercy of the Son as your source of regeneration, with the power of the Holy Spirit as your strength to endure, may you journey with hope, reach with courage, soar with grace, and always sense the presence of God in your life. Amen.